We're here on Caffrey's Hill Farm in Northern Ireland's centenary year, and we're just going to have a chat about the, the farm's history. Stephen, any idea when did uh, Caffrey acquire this farm? This farm was purchased back in 1963, Brian, by the, the then Ministry, as it was known. Mm. A total of a thousand hectares was purchased for the princely sum of thirty-nine thousand pounds. And I know that the farm goes up to three hundred and eighty meters uh, because many's a time I've been foundered up there, and anybody you talk to will, will kindly uh, tell you about the driving sleet and the, the wind and the rain. I wonder, do you think the farm's changed much over the years, Stephen? Parts of it has. When you look back through historical maps, you see it the actual bit around the buildings. The, the green ground or then by ground hasn't changed a lot, uh, and also probably around the, the you know the, the the hill part hasn't. But the moorland, yes, back in the 1950s uh, through to the 80s, there was quite a bit of drainage and some forestation, and that probably was seen as increasing production, you know, from from the environment. But now, obviously, you're involved. With, with returning some of that back to what it would have been like at the start of the 20th century. Yeah, and I suppose part of that is, is land designation as well, so the, the area is a severely disadvantaged area, and it's also Antrim Hills SPA, so that's a, an area for a special protected area for hen, harrier and merlin, so we're always uh, keeping an eye out what we should do uh, for foraging hen harriers in particular. But, but it is important to remember the farm is still the home to 100 suckler cows, and 1100 ewes and there, there has to be a financial and a production from the environment so i think the two can work together now brian i think that and they have really worked together because since 2009 um, th when they started the glenwary hills regeneration partnership they've achieved great success um, ireland's highest population density now of irish hare and uh, red grouse and uh, the place has been managed very well for breeding waders and for hen and harrier coming into forage. And all that's been achieved. I don't think there's been any impact on, on beef and sheep performance at all. No, like in fact, this year, Brian, we've produced more lambs from the hill farm than we've probably ever done. Like there's, a, there's 1,100 ewes up here and we've produced over, just over 1,600 lambs. And, you know, again, I think that shows that the two are marrying quite well. In a way, we've turned time back with our, our suckler herd in particular in that when the farm was first bought there was a herd established of, of blue grey cows as mm -hmm. we would call them back in 1965 and that was a, a, a Galloway shorthorn cross and we went back in 2002 and looked at what we could do to replicate that and we come up with the three breed cross predominantly based on science and the three breeds are the shorthorn, the Aberdeen Angus and the Limousin and we are now winning over 95 calves for the 100 cows up here at the hill farm. That's excellent. So we're now looking at flood alleviation, carbon sequestration, carbon storage and water quality. And, and our peatlands are in the catchment for Kalilian Reservoir, which serves 60,000 people uh, from Larne to Ballymena. Uh, and we're trying to maximise our water quality and our carbon storage through how we manage our peatland so particularly with the 60 hectare forest to bog project and we're starting now to to um, re-wet open moorland but i think too brian there's a lot of changes to policies and and yes our our practices have evolved but the one big constant at the hill farm here has been the flow of people whether it be students or farmers or upland land managers our doors has always been open and there is a lot of demonstration opportunities here at the hill to show what we're doing. There's, there's something here to interest everyone. Good evening everyone um, and, and welcome to the third webinar in this beef uh, conference series. So um, my name is Aileen Lawson um, and I'm a senior policy officer at the Ulster Farmers Union and I'm here to take you through the proceedings this evening. So the focus of this series has uh, been on solutions to deliver uh, sustainable beef production and tonight uh, the focus is on environmental sustainability. So as, as most of you are aware, environmental sustainability covers a wide range of issues 
such as air quality, ammonia, biodiversity, water quality, and so forth. But tonight we're going to focus in on one aspect um, in particular, which is really topical right now. So that's the whole issue around climate change uh, and carbon. So tonight we're going to explore uh, carbon, an opportunity and a challenge. So we have three uh, presentations coming up um, followed by a question and answer session. So we expect this whole webinar to last no more than one and a half hours and we're aiming to finish um, at half nine um, tonight. So just a few housekeeping notes um, to, to be aware of, just to highlight that this webinar is being recorded um, and a link will be sent out afterwards if you want to watch it again. For question and answers, um, if you do want to ask questions, please do put it into the, the Q&A box. Um, there's a button at the bottom of your screen if you're using a computer uh, or a laptop. And if you're using a mobile device or a, or a um, tablet, it's probably at the top um, of your device. So please do put in your, the questions as we go along, as things come into your head, but we'll not be answering those until we come to the panel session um, at the end of the presentation. Just to highlight, don't use the chat box. Um, if you put a question into the chat box, the chances are we won't see it um, and it'll not be answered. So please make sure you use that Q&A button. So we'll just move on now to our first presentation this evening, and that is going to be delivered by Dr. Um, Elizabeth McGowan. So uh, Elizabeth is the Director of Sustainable Agri Food Sciences at AFBE. Um, and Elizabeth's going to give us an overview on carbon and the key strategies to deliver. So we'll just hand over to you, Elizabeth. You're on mute there, Elizabeth. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. The, the, <laughs> the new problem of 2020. Thank you. So good evening, everybody. And uh, delighted to be here this evening to present to you on the, with a the focus on, on carbon. And I hope you will forgive me because I am going to present, first of all, just a, a number of statistics um, to help us get a feel for, you know, what carbon is about, the, the scale of this challenge, but also then I'll move on to some high level strategies that we should be looking at, which really provide opportunity to address the carbon issue and actually improve perhaps profitability and sustainability of farms. And indeed, create a, a really unique position for Northern Ireland beef production and, and even milk production to be globally leading on a sustainability agenda. So to, to start with then, you know, the unfortunate reality is that climate change is happening as a result of our emissions um, of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And indeed, you know, over the past three years, you know, as it's been demonstrated through our grass check um, program from Hillsborough here, we have seen very dry spells, long prolonged dry spells throughout the summer and, and a significant dips in grass growth as a result. So, you know, we are starting even in Northern Ireland here to see those extremes of weather conditions and how they're affecting our, our grazing patterns. Now, the UK government as a result has committed to reduce our emissions to net zero by 2050. And of course, Scotland have had their own target Northern Ireland, we, we have two bills going through um, Stormont at the minute, um, all to, to uh, contribute to this UK's ambition of net zero by 2050. But it's clear, and you'll see hopefully in the slides that follow here, that agriculture and land use are going to be really important players in that ambition for the UK as a whole to reach net zero as well as very importantly, providing that, that fundamental need that we all have around food and nutritious quality food. So first of all, just to help explain what exactly greenhouse gases are, because we use this word an awful, awful lot, but it, it's, it's, it's a combination of a number of gases. So the first fact is that greenhouse gases are natural and indeed they're actually needed to keep the earth warm. Uh, if they weren't in the atmosphere, we'd actually all be absolutely freezing. So they're actually a natural um, source um, from natural processes. Problem is the human population has grown so much and that human activity has driven 
um, increases in transport, electricity need and, and food production due to the scale of our population. And due to that human activity, problem is we now have too many greenhouse gases. Now, with regards to agriculture, um, the main greenhouse gases are really methane and nitrous oxide and to a lesser degree, carbon dioxide. So if you can see from this diagram on the right hand side, just hopefully tries to explain in simple terms where that methane and nitrous oxide in particular are coming from. So a lot of the methane comes from the ruminant animal when it burps, and that's as a result of digesting its feed, as well as from the, the slurry and the manure that's generated. Nitrous oxide, on the other hand, and that's N2O, nitrous oxide is usually emitted from the land as a result of spreading both the manure on the land and, and fertilizer. So those are the two main sources. And then the other one just notable to um, mention is methane emissions from, from wetlands. So if wetlands aren't um, managed properly, they are also a significant contributor of, of methane emissions to the atmosphere. Now, a lot of you have probably heard this terminology around global warming potential. And basically, whilst greenhouse gases is said that they're a combination of different gases, methane, nitrous oxide and carbon dioxide. And because they're different gases, they're going to have a different effect on the atmosphere. And indeed, methane, it is well recognised, is a short lived gas. It lives for about 12 years in the atmosphere and then is converted to CO2 and water. Whereas nitrous oxide lives a much, much longer in the atmosphere and is, is much more potent. So when we talk about the global warming potential of greenhouse gases, in order to try and standardize you know, their impact, we talk about them as having carbon equivalents. So methane has um, the equivalence of 28 um, and nitrous oxide 265. So that, you know, that tells you that nitrous oxide is a very potent gas. Methane isn't any isn't as potent but is more potent than carbon dioxide. So you've maybe also heard about this concept of GWP star and the, the, the struggle that we currently have is there's a lot of new evidence coming out with regards to GWP star and there's positives and negatives for it. What we do know is that it, it does take into consideration that methane is a short-lived gas and only stays in the atmosphere for about 12 years as I said but it also would, you know, it also has a positive impact from a calculation perspective, but only up when methane emissions are falling. And that's an important caveat to when we're using GWP star as a matrix. Overall, you know, there's a lot of scientific evidence coming out and new knowledge coming out with regards to this. So it's difficult to really take a position at this moment in time whether GWP star or GWP 100 is indeed the right matrix going forward. And we'll have to wait on further intelligence and, and evidence coming out to support either of those. This next graph, and as, as, um, apologies, these next few slides do, do contain a number of graphs, but by starters, I just want to look back, first of all, to 1990. So in Northern Ireland, the, the total amount of greenhouse gases has reduced and has reduced significantly, um, which, which is great. What happens in government is whenever they're totaling up all of them, the greenhouse gases that are emitted, they split that across the agricultural sector, the business sector, the energy supply sector, et cetera, et cetera. They measure and they monitor the, the greenhouse gases um, that are emitted and indeed sequestered, for example, from land use um, across the sectors and come up with the total. So in 1990, we were sitting just under 25 megatons of, of greenhouse gas CO2 equivalents emitted. In 2019, that has come down to about 21.4, so a good reduction. But it is notable that it is the energy sector, the, this grey box, it has had a, a significant contribution to that reduction and indeed the waste sector to some degree as well. Now, just to call this out and stick with the same format of this bar chart, um, the, the unfortunate reality for Northern Ireland is within that 21.4 megatons um, of emissions, agriculture is the main contributor. So from this top grey box, as you can see, as well as the, the agricultural figure circled in red just at the bottom of the table. 
can see that there's about 5.3 megatons of carbon equivalents emitted from agriculture, and it is the biggest um, contributor within Northern Ireland. Now, it's also, I think, worthy to note um, that Lulu CF is a sector, land use and land use change in forestry, is a sector, of course, that works hand in hand with the agricultural sector. And within the land use and land use change, Lulu CF sector, it is both an emitter of greenhouse gases as well as sequestering greenhouse gases. So a lot of the sequestration is done through forestry, grassland, etc. But a lot of emissions then comes from peatlands. And as you can see over in the right hand table here, unfortunately, the, the amount of carbon that's being sequestered within that Lulu CF category is lower than the amount of emissions that are being emitted. And as a result, our Lulu CF land use, land use change in forestry sector is actually a net source of emissions at the minute. So that is an area that we need to work heavily on to make it a net sink um, going forward. Excuse me. But as I said, you know, we have two climate change bills going through with um, Stormont at the minute. And one of them very much aligns with the advice from the Climate Change Committee which talks about Northern Ireland setting a target of 82% of net zero by 2050. And, and the CCC would suggest and su support the fact that we, and recognize that we are producing a lot of food in Northern Ireland. And therefore this target reflects that agriculture is a significant industry in Northern Ireland. And if we could achieve this target of 82%, by 2050, that would contribute to the UK's overall net zero by 2050. But this graph hopefully helps to illustrate to you just what 82% even in, in 2050 looks like compared to 1990 levels and 2019 levels. So as you can see, a significant reduction is needed. And you know, I would I would stress as well that you know, these bars, these nice colorful bars are all the sectors combined to come to 21.4 megatons in 2019, whereas this green bar is, is again all the sectors, so significant reduction needed for all the sectors. The other, just to call that out in comparison to where the agriculture sector is at the minute, um, so in 1990 our total emissions from agriculture were 5.3 megatons, 2019 it's 5.6. And as I say, that, that figure in 2050 is actually 5.1. So it's a bit lower than where agriculture is at the minute. Um, but as a, as a stress, that, that is for all the sectors going forward. The other thing the, Lulu, the, the CCC, the Committee for Climate um, Change, have noted and, and projected is that our Lulu CF sector that I was just chatting about, which is currently a net source of emissions, would actually be net zero. Now we feel as scientists that it could go lower than that and could actually be a, a sink, but um, within the model projections at the minute, it's likely to be a net, net zero, so net zero. So therefore sequestering as much as it is emitting. So just to deep dive further, we bit further into the beef and sheep and, and dairy comparison of their emissions. Um, this graph just simply demonstrates a comparison between 1990, the, the orange bars, versus the emissions in 2019 within the dairy, the beef and the sheep sectors. So as you can see there, you know, between 1990 and 2019, the dairy sector have increased their emissions, um, as have the beef, but not to the same degree. Sheep have actually decreased a little bit. But I think what's, what's clear from this graph is the fact that our beef industry in Northern Ireland is the, the predominant source of emissions within the ruminant sector. But this is not forgetting, so whilst I, I don't want to depress anybody, I, I do simply want to set this out and to demonstrate you know, where those emissions are coming from and uh, what needs to be tackled. But we are not forgetting the fact that the you know our dairy, beef, sheep, pig, and poultry sector is largely feeding eight to ten million people um, across the whole of the UK, and that is a, a very important um, consideration of the support that the sector delivers for that food security agenda. So moving back to our, our the hot spots as we call them within beef production. So this was a piece of work um, conducted by Rothamsted Research, um, people we have collaborated with quite extensively. 
And um, what they did was within the carbon footprint of a typical beef um, finishing system, um, they looked at the relative contribution of um, enteric fermentation, fertilizer, and, and other outputs. Now in this, uh, look, you can do various different calculations, but in this calculation, which was you know, aligned with a typical beef finishing system, the, the total um, carbon footprint, if you like, was coming out at 18.5 kilograms of carbon equivalents per kilogram of life weight gain. And within that, as you can see, there was about half, just under half of that was attributable to the burping of cows. So when the animals were digesting their feed and emitting methane emissions as a result, that was about half of the contribution within that carbon footprint. The other half is really aligned with the manure and fertilizer applied to the land. So if we add 2.5 with 3.56, 2.03, we come up with just under about another half of the, the emissions as a result of manure and fertilizer application to the system. So as you can see here from this basic carbon footprint, about half of the emissions are coming from diet digestion of the animal and the other half from land manure and nitrogen application to land. Now, whilst those are all setting out the challenges um, and where the hotspots are, there are huge opportunities um, to really move towards net zero and reduce emissions and sequester carbon. And just to overview those very briefly, the first big obvious one on farm is to drive efficiency. And of course, this will be a win-win and um, driving efficiency will reduce the, the carbon intensity and will also, of course, improve profitability. So, you know, there are lots of known solutions to drive efficiency and a key part of, of the jigsaw is the, the rapid adoption of those known solutions. But there are also lots of new um, solutions coming forward to vaccines for animal health um, new ways of monitoring ill health early and therefore intervening you know, earlier when an animal maybe does fall ill and, and reducing the waste with regards to productivity or even should the worst happen. Um, improving productivity, of course, creating the same for less and, and driving better husbandry. So you know, Bill and Mark, will, um, Bill and Phelan will go into more of this later on, um, but improving efficiency is a huge area that we all can work, um, work on to improve our carbon footprint and reduce emissions. The other uh, area, which is probably more into the future, is around novel and alternative feeds. And from a scientific perspective, there are a lot of new feed additives will be emerging. And one of them that's currently coming to the market, I think sooner rather than later, is around 3NOP. It is a feed additive which has been um, which is being marketed as potentially reducing emissions by 20 to 30 percent. So that could have a very significant impact. Um, we've got a lot of research focused on um, chemical compounds from seaweed as well, and they are being um, thought of as being key contributors to making additions going forward. Then closer to home, we've got multi-species swords, and indeed multi-species swords can be as simple as even a, a two, two different species in the sword example clover and um, versus up to maybe six species in the, in the sward and indeed some of the Rothamsted work has found that you know whenever I talked earlier about half of the emissions coming from the manure and nitrogen application to the land the Rothamsted work find that 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 could be halved by the application and use of clover in the sward alongside perennial ryegrass. So there are new, new ways of working and even known ways of working to reduce um, methane and nitrous oxide emissions from the feeding system. And indeed, you know, some of these will directly affect the methane emissions and others will affect how the rumen microbiome um, interacts and, and ultimately reduces emissions. Other key areas that are coming forward include new fertilizer formulations. So as I said earlier, nitrous oxide is the other key consideration in, in the greenhouse gas story for ruminants. And I know fertilizer companies and, and universities are working very hard on new fertilizer formulations to try and reduce the, uh, the potential of nitrous oxide being emitted from the application. And then, as I said earlier, there's novel grazing mixtures, the likes of multi-species swords. 
there's going to be a lot of technology coming forward. There's a lot of technology already. Um, and there'll be a lot more technology coming forward. You know, the camera down the bottom here just shows a thermal imaging um, of an animal to detect ill health earlier, to bring in interventions earlier, to reduce the day of sick and even to reduce that, that animal falling completely. So there will be more technologies coming on and they're being developed as, as we talk. And some of those will include genotyping and phenotyping of animals and looking at the microbiome and even manipulating the microbiome. Um, genetics will play an important role in, in breeding for um, animals with reduced methane emissions as well. So those technologies are all coming forward in the science community at the minute. And then lastly, the, you know, the big one then, the last big one here on the farm is maximising the ability of carbon sequestration and optimising soil health. And I think Phelan will talk later about the importance of pH and soil health to help carbon sequestration. And in, indeed, you know, our forestry and agroforestry, hedgerows and even grassland are a huge opportunity when managed correctly to sequester significant amounts of carbon. So just on that, um, some work that we did with partners across the UK to identify you know, what possibilities for carbon removal were, you know, included forestry, and agroforestry, and indeed the work at Aspie Lock Gall has proven that that has, can be very successful amalgamated with sheep systems. And as the CAFRI video was demonstrating earlier, you know, these environmental interventions working alongside livestock production both can thrive extremely well together and the work at Loch Gall has demonstrated that the productivity of sheep, for example, from an agroforestry platform can be equally as good as on a, a, a perennial ryegrass sward. Um, we've then got a lot of uh, potential to sequester carbon in our soils and indeed the long-term study plots here at Aspey Hillsborough would suggest that you know, we are not yet plateauing with regards to that ability of our soils to sequester carbon. And that, you know, that, that carbon sequestration is actually maximized when cattle slurry and manure is applied to the grassland as well. There's further down the pipeline of development, we have products such as biochar and enhanced feathering. And some of the work here at our anaerobic digester is looking at biochar and its incorporation into soil to help fast track carbon sequestration. And then on over to the right, we have more technical um, uh, technologies for removal of carbon. Um, now, the bioenergy talks to the anaerobic digestion story, which, of course, can play a significant role in circulation of energy and offsetting some fuel energy through the methane and biogas production. And then, of course, we have very high technology with regards to direct air carbon capture. Now, with regards to where these um, technologies are on the readiness level, this, this table hopefully helps us tease that out. So, you know, agro forestry, agroforestry and carbon sequestration are, they're here now, they're ready to be used, they're low cost, and therefore they have a very high potential and readiness right now for carbon capture. The other technologies are a little bit far behind, further behind biochar and, and enhanced weathering is so a low technology readiness level, but it has a relatively high cost and therefore is a bit further out when it comes to capturing carbon. Enhanced weathering um, has a high cost as well as has you know, those, those direct carbon capture methods, as you can imagine. The last area that I really would want you know, to encourage everybody on the call tonight to really think about hard is measuring and monitoring calculating carbon footprints, understanding where your hotspots are and acting accordingly. So you know, there are a range of calculators out there and I'll come back to that in a little minute, but it's really important that as an industry, we start to measure you know, our productivity, our inputs and our outputs and monitoring those. We need to use trusted calculators and look, what I would say is very much talk to your CAFRI advisor for independent advice around that and act act on the advice that you're given to deal with the hot spots that you can identify because that will ultimately optimize carbon capture and reduce the emissions. So just to touch on that point a little bit with regards to calculators and, and especially comparing it with the inventory, the carbon story is a complicated one and I hope I haven't completely bamboozled you with all those graphs earlier on 
But the other complication is, is how it can sometimes be measured. So there's kind of two main ways of how greenhouse gases and carbon is measured. At the governmental level, we have the infantry, and that really talked back to the graphs that I had at the top of the presentation. That's mainly used by government and measures the gross emissions and the gross sequestration at a national and regional scale. And that is needed mainly to report to government on the progress and especially to the inter intergovernmental grant panels for climate change, um, IPCC. So uh, these inventories are constantly being updated with activity data as well as the best science. And uh, they're constantly being improved upon uh, as we go through, but they are based on science, robust scientific studies. Calculators then are slightly different in that they are mainly used by industry. There is a wide range of calculators in development because it's a bit of a commercial enterprise in their own right. Um, they are more focused at a farm scale and more focused to helping businesses establish their own carbon footprint and therefore identify key hotspots and opportunities for improvement at that farm scale. However, like anything that's on the market, you know, calculators can vary in their quality and some will be better than others. Um, so it is important, as I said earlier, to talk to your CAFE advisor to get advice on, on what carbon calculator to use and what it's telling you and even help with inputting some of the data and you know, the, the interpretation of the results that are coming out. Overall, what I would say is you know, calculators really you know, there's better one, there's ones that are better than others. Um, and please don't draw me on which ones those are. But um, we, uh, it's fair to say that all of them need to be continually worked on and improved accuracy. So in conclusion, um, you know, it's clear Northern Ireland beef provides vital nutrients in support of human health, and from a range of land types, many of which are not suitable for food production for direct human consumption. So therefore, you know, beef production plays an important role in land management and producing food for the human population from land types that, that couldn't be used for direct protein production. However, you know, I think I've probably demonstrated the challenge of low stroke net zero carbon in the beef sector as a whole is a significant one. However, there's a lot of innovation and scientific developments coming forward, both from science and industry. And they, I do believe, have a lot of potential to deliver and build on the foundations that are currently being led by, by yourselves as farmers and, and current science outcomes. However, I would, I really want this to be a call to action around accelerated adoption of current known technologies we have a huge amount to do to reach net zero. And one of the tools that we currently have is adopting the, the knowledge that we currently have and adopting that at pace and really making use of it. And then lastly, I would stress that you know, there's a real opportunity for livestock farming and agriculture to collaborate with other industries, for example, the energy sector and help the energy sector offset its fossil fuels, fossil fuel use with the use of biomethane um, gases, um, renewable energies, et cetera, et cetera. So huge opportunity for the livestock industry to collaborate with others on this journey. And that tonight concludes my presentation. I'll hand back to Aileen. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, and thank you for setting the scene so well on all of the, the key issues um, around, around carbon. So now we're going to look at um, the, the um, sort of practical side of what um, farmers can do on their own farms. Um, and just before we move on to that, I would say just if you have any questions, please do keep putting them into the Q&A box and we'll pick them up at the end of the session. So um, as I say, we're now going to have a video. So we're going to go on a bit of a farm tour up to Bill Harper's farm. Um, Bill farms up on the north coast near um, Port Rush and Bill is a member of the different business development groups, including an environmental um, business development group, and he's also chair of our UFE Environment Committee. So um, we're now going to see the video um, and hopefully the technology will work OK. Um, and also just to mention that also featured in the video is Sinead Mathers, who is Bill's Agri Environment Advisor from CAFRI. So we'll now, um, we'll now see the video. Hello, 
My name is Bill Harper. I'm farming 175 acres, uh, just about two miles outside Port Rush here in the north coast of County Antrim. Uh, I have um, 60 suckler cows, uh, Limousin Cross running with Aberdeen Angus bulls, and all the offspring on the farm uh, are taken through to beef to slaughter and they go to uh, an Aberdeen Angus scheme. I try to have a closed system on the farm. Everything that the cattle eat uh, is grown here on the farm, so there's some cereals grown. Cows calve at two year old. The heifers are bought uh, as suckled calves in the store ring. Uh, the bulls go in at the 1st of July and the aim is to start calving uh, from about the 9th of April onwards. Most of the cattle calve outside and um, there's a sort of service level agreement with the cows. Um, their part, um, they have to produce me a live calf every year. They have to calve it themselves, get it up and get it to suckle them. Uh, my part of the uh, agreement is that I provide full board and lodgings for free. Uh, the calves are weaned at about uh, 10 months of age, so you get two months holiday if you're a cow on this farm, uh, and then you're back to work again. Um, I have been uh, part of the um, business development groups uh, since they began, uh, beef, beef uh, and suckler cow groups, uh, I'm also in an arable group and uh, I joined the environmental business development group last year when they were first set up. Uh, before that I would have uh, participated uh, in financial benchmarking maybe for the last 20 years with the uh, department advisors. Uh, I must say that a lot of the ideas and, and techniques that you will see on the farm later in the video uh, will really have been gleaned from what was happening on other farms and I learnt that through the business development groups. Um, I have very few original ideas of my own but I like to think I'm quite good at uh, spotting good ideas and then copying them and um, when, I, when I first joined the business development groups I, I wondered about it, you know, are we trying to pull ourselves up our bootlaces here just looking at what our neighbours are doing but in actual fact the opposite has proved to be the case. Uh, I love getting onto other people's farms because you'll always learn something, uh, they're always doing things better than you're doing them. Um, and you can bring them back and, uh, and apply them to your farm if, if they suit. So I, I'm a firm believer in, in, in BDGs. Um, carbon benchmarking, and there's been a lot of talk about carbon and global warming and climate change, and we're at the sharp end of that because we're trying to farm in the teeth of climate change. Um, and agriculture is getting a bad press for producing too much carbon and greenhouse gases. So I think carbon benchmarking is the way forward, how are you going to change what you're doing if you don't really know what you're doing and unless you measure it and get a figure for it then um, you're really just groping about in the dark. So I have carbon benchmark and I'm really glad that I have carbon benchmarks because, because it's been very informative. Uh, and a lot of what it's told me is uh, confirmatory because you're doing the right thing, keep on doing it. Uh, but of course there's areas for uh, improvement and you'll hear about those later on. There have been a number of opportunities over the years to take part in countryside management schemes. Uh, I've planted about four kilometres of hedgerow uh, in the last 20 years on the farm. This is quite an exposed coastal location and the hedgerows are now up um, and, and you'll see some of them in the videos. Uh, they're absolutely marvellous here because it's the only shelter we have. I, I wish I had planted hedgerows 25 years earlier. Um, the Countryside Management Scheme was offering a grant for the, for the establishment of the plants and the two protective fences. Um, my hedgerows are now at the stage where the thorns have grown out through the sheep wear and it's actually the hedge is holding the fence up rather than the fence protecting the hedge. Um, but the hedges are now stock proof and they provide a lot of shelter. Uh, I'm a firm believer in soil sampling and pH. Um, I notice that um, there's quite a lot of earthworms in this soil. If, if you dig uh, a sod, there's earthworms popping out everywhere, and I think earthworms are a good indicator of soil health. Um, to that end, um, I would get all soil sampled about once every four years. And once again, um, there was a, a, an opportunity in 2018 where you could have every field sampled uh, and the ministry paid for it. 
um, and they're talking now about bringing in a scheme again next year to start where we sample all the fields. Um, that has been quite informative for me because I applied lime where the pH was below 6 and some of my fields are up nearly 6.5 and they're all between 6 and 6.5. Um, if I'm going to reseed the field after the third year of winter barley then it'll be soil tested and it'll be limed. Um, I'll not say if necessary because you always need a bit of lime so depending on how much lime is required and that lime is put on. Um, I notice that um, if you want to have clover you can, you'll can you need lime and you'll need a, a, a pH of 6.5 and the clover responds well. That clover then fixes nitrogen and that means I have to buy purchase less nitrogen. Hello, I'm Bill Zagri, Environment Advisor, and um, Bill is in his um, it's the North Antrim Environmental Farm and BDG Group, and um, as part of the membership of that group, um, there's the opportunity to carbon benchmark each farmer's business. So um, Bill was actually one of the first people in the group um, to volunteer to carbon benchmark. Um, so his, he's already um, given his data for financial benchmarking purposes. So it was really just a matter of topping up on that data and um, maybe 20-30% more extra information needed. Um, then the AgriCalc, um, Scottish Rural College calculator, um, the data was fed into that and a carbon benchmark report was produced for Bill's farm business. The whole process was relatively straightforward and um, it's a good idea to, to get an idea for each farm business of where they're emissions are arising from to, to be able to measure it and to see the, the action that you can take to try and reduce the emissions. Um, so whenever Bill's carbon footprint uh, report came back, he is also in a beef and a crops business development group. So myself and his crops advisor and beef advisor met uh, and there was a three-way conversation between myself, the advisors and Bill just to make sure that w the recommendations that were made for Bill to reduce his emissions weren't going to actually affect the productivity on his farm um, or counteract any advice that they would have been given. Um, so as a result of that conversation, um, then myself and Bill sat and, and looked at his footprint and the three main areas of emissions were methane, carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide. Um, so it gave the quantity of the emissions in Bill's farm and also the source um, of those emissions where they were coming from. So basically the, the enteric fermentation in beef cattle is producing the most of Bill's uh, methane emissions and his manure management. Um, you know, the likes, for example, of extending his uh, grazing season so the, uh, the cattle are at uh, grass for longer will also reduce his methane emissions um, but with Bill's ground being heavy and him being in the north and um, you know the, the north and our coast it's kind of hard maybe to try and extend that's very much dependent on weather um, and ground type so we looked then at where the nitrous oxide was um, the next biggest emissions and that was as a result of fertilizer being spread and also manure so the opportunity for Bill there because that was quite high he was benchmarked against the top 25% of producers in the UK and Bill actually was coming out at better than those producers which was a credit to him from the point of view of all the things that he's doing already on his farm operating such an, an efficient and profitable enterprise so already Bill was you know soil sampling, liming to increase pH to make efficient use of nutrients also feeding his own that's a massive one for Bill really in that he's feeding his own cereals to his cattle so he's no emissions there from you know the embedded emissions of CO2 from taking and purchase feed um, and also then he is he has a for 10 years he's been using GPS fertilizer sower so that gives him guidance when he's sowing his fertilizer that he's not overlapping with his applications and you know inefficiently using the, his chemical fertilizer so already there's a lot been done on farm. He's operating his paddock grazing system, making great use of his of his grass, and also making top quality silage, which means there's less of a requirement then for, you know, the 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 cereals. Um, so with all that in mind, um, the one thing that was sticking out and was obvious from his carbon feedback report was that his fertilizer use was slightly high. Um, so the opportunities for Bill were to use Lassie, he has a trail and shoe, 
um, and he's going to, with his contract, use the dribble bar and apply in his own slurry, use the trailing shoe. So with a lot of these um, recommendations, you're getting spin-offs as well, but you know, it's also cutting ammonia emissions. So whenever Bill's applying with a trailing shoe, um, obviously the, the slurry's getting closer to the, to the, actively where the grass is growing. Um, and there's 60% reduction in using the trail and shoe over a, pla a splash plate in terms of ammonia, which also has that spin off to in reduction of uh, nitrous oxide emissions. Also then, um, Bill, because of where he is in his ground type, and this is quite difficult to get his slurry on in spring, but the earlier he can get the, the slurry on to the, the ground whenever the plant stack starts to actively grow, um, he then is making better use of his slurry um, and then also protected urea. So Bill wasn't using protected urea. Um, again, with using protected urea over can, there's a 70% reduction in nitrous oxide. So Bill decided that he's going to move then to protected urea, as well as spring application of slurry, and as well as the lessee um, application methods to reduce ammonia and also reduce nitrous oxide. So there's a redu reduction of the emissions, um, but there's also then offsetting the emissions. So the likes of Bill, who's already very efficient, every farmer, I suppose, can look at their efficiency levels on farm and see where those savings can be made, where we can tighten up on efficiencies. Bill's was fertilizer and offsetting emissions is looking at your sequestration. So Bill here behind us has got one acres of, one acre of woodland planted 20 years ago under the countryside management scheme. An acre of woodland at that age is sequestering 4.4 tonnes of CO2. So for Bill, that will be offsetting his emissions as well. Bill, as you can see in his farm, there's a, a, a it's a credit to him in terms of his hedgerows that he's, he's planted down through the years with the various environmental schemes. He's let them grow wide, let them grow high. It has a spin-off in terms of biodiversity, biosecurity, um, you know, stock art nosing at each other through the hedges and where he is situated here just close to the sea, obviously there's that benefit in terms of shelter, but there was research done um, at Alfby, Jonathan Blair and Rodrigo Alave found that planting hedgerows and, and hedgerows sequester 1.04 tonnes of carbon per kilometre per year. These are the replacement cows. They were bought uh, as suckled calf heifers out of the suck calf ring. Um, the aim is to calve them between 24 and 26 months. Uh, we measure them a month before they go to the bull with the um, pelvic measuring device, which uh, allows me to remove 25 to 30 percent of the ones with the small uh, of the of the group and they would we would remove the ones with the small pelvises they're the ones that will get the calving difficulties dead calves cesareans uh, i <clears throat> don't really want any of that uh, there were 15 of these um, there are now nine uh, we had selected 10 one of the 10 turned out calf <clears throat> uh, she had to have a cesarean so she won't be put back in calf again. Unfortunately, the calf is alive, so she'll, she'll rear the calf away and then she'll be sold for beef. Uh, these here, I'm fairly confident, uh, will be able to calve unaided, or at least with minimal uh, aid. Um, and I find that uh, if you're not carrying those uh, sort of 25% of the heifers that, that are going to give you trouble uh, at calving, then you're not feeding unnecessarily and it's more efficient. We're standing here in the field of uh, winter barley, uh, variety of Valerie. It was uh, combined on the 3rd of August. Um, the barley will be used to feed the finishing cattle. Uh, suckler cows don't get any cereals, they just get silage. Um, there's several reasons why I uh, try to grow all the food that the animals eat. First of all, I know exactly what they're eating. Um, and I have full control of the inputs and the quality of them. Secondly, uh, I find it's cost effective to grow your own cereals if your land is suitable for growing cereals. Thirdly, um, it allows me to uh, do a reseeding program. I, I usually plough out of lee, of course, and it's in winter cereals for three years. And at the end of the third year, I then plough and reseed. So I'm, I'm back into fresh grass. If I do that, uh, be, grow between 12 and 20 acres uh, every year, then um, 
you're reseeding uh, on average six or seven acres a year and um, um, my swords would last 10 to 20 years. I wouldn't reseed any oftener than that. And so I think it's quite an efficient uh, way to feed the cattle. Uh, and I would mix the, I would bruise the barley, it's stored with an uh, acid preservative uh, or an aeration bin, which is quite old fashioned, but it's cheap. You just draw cool air down through it. Um, the barley is then put through a bruiser and it's augered into the diet feeder uh, to mix with the silage. So it's, it's um, a low labour requirement and it's quite efficient. We're in a, we're in a paddock of suckler cows. Um, these cows are mainly Limousin Cross and they're, they're with an Aberdeen Angus bull. Uh, the bull is put into the cows on the 1st of July and that means that uh, on paper anyway the cows should be starting to calve on the 9th of April. Um, on the 9th of April on this farm they probably won't be in the fields so we'll have to suffer the first few cows calving uh, in the house which is always a dicey business. Um, the rest of them, the vast majority of them then calve outside. Anything that calves in the, in the house at the beginning of April goes to the field uh, as soon as the calf really is up and learn to suck. Um, Aberdeen Angus uh, I use uh, partly because there's a, a premium for the beef but they're a nice temperament of animal to work with. Uh, the calves are usually born unassisted and they seem to want to live and they want to get up and suckle. Um, the cows are grazed in a paddock system. There are 11 paddocks in this rotation. Um, the cows stay in them for between two and three days and then they're moved on which gives me a rotation of 22 or 24 to 28 days of a rotation. Um, I would end up topping the grass at least once in the season. Um, We've had a very dry season this year and the, I'm afraid the cows have run out of grass. I am I am persisting with the paddock system and as you can see behind me in the distance there, there's a silage feeding trailer and I'm using big bales that I'd left over from last year. Uh, that seems to content them. Um, there's nobody up around us roaring and demanding to be changed, so that's a good sign. Uh, they'll be changed again tomorrow and the next paddock, this is the second day that they've, they've been in this paddock. Uh, I've started to, to measure the grass in the paddocks with uh, a plate meter. Um, the plate meter is saying that there's 1,830 kilos of grass per hectare in this paddock. Um, they would be going into a paddock ideally when there would be about 3,000, 3,100 kilos in it. Um, and uh, they seem to be happy enough to graze that down quite tightly. Okay, we're now standing in um, a field of multi-species uh, grasses um, and plants that was sown and reseeded on the 7th of May. It had been in cereals last year. Um, it's a six species mix. There's plantain, chicory, timothy, uh, white clover, red clover, and perennial ryegrass and it will really reduce the um, amount of nitrogen that I'm going to have to put on this sward uh, in the future. I'm hoping that uh, it will fit into my grazing rotation. Uh, it was grazed uh, really for the first time by a group of cows and calves and they came out of it uh, last Friday which is five days ago and it's already begun to, beginning to recover quite well. Um, the advantages are that the, the chicory and the plantain are quite deep rooting and that will help to improve drainage in the field and also in a, in a dry spell it will draw water from deeper down and keep the soil a bit more open and maybe counteract uh, a bit of soil compaction. Um, it's, uh, it's new to the farm, uh, I learned about it in the environmental development group and um, thought it was worthwhile trying. Um, the chicory and plantain may and white clover may disappear eventually after four years or so but hopefully by that stage then the, the perennial ryegrass will still be there and the white clover will still be there so we'll still have a productive sward. He decided not only from the point of view that planting a multi-species sward will sequester more carbon and you know they're deeper tap roots and there's more organic matter in the soil but also because of the legumes, the clover, the white clover and the red clover, nitrogen's fixed. 
and therefore then that there's less of a requirement for nitrogen to be applied to the ground. So the grasses, the timothy, the perennial ryegrass will get the benefit of that nitrogen for growth. Um, research has been done recently to show that uh, multi-species sward herbage yields um, are equivalent to that of perennial ryegrass with 45% um, less nitrogen used. So from the point of view of Bill's um, future carbon footprints, he'll be using less fertilizer um, and then that will show a difference in his carbon footprint when it's completed again in two years time. Um, Multi-species swords also, there's research to show that there's a, a benefit in terms of production. Um, there was research done um, that showed um, daily live weight gain was 300 grams per day better for steers on multi-species swords versus the perennial ryegrass swords. Um, so hopefully Bill will have the production benefits for the, the cattle that are grazing the sward as well. Also, the nature of multi-species swards, you've got the plantain and the chicory, which are deeper rooting. So they're actually down at a different plane of, of soil and, and mining nutrients from lower down the soil profile, which is improving soil health. Obviously those minerals and nutrients are then available in the, in the, the vegetation, which the cattle are grazing on. You've got anthelmintic properties as well with the chicory and the plantain. So that will all benefit Bill's, um, you know, I suppose warming regime and whatever as well. That hopefully there'll be, a, you know, a less um, warmers needed to be used on farm. So that's the end of the tour. Uh, thank you very much for coming to visit the farm. Um, if you have any questions, and I'm sure there will be questions, uh, you can air them on the webinar and I'll be on the panel. So see you then. Thank you, um, Bill and Sinead. Uh, that was a, a really great video, and it was really nice to to see um, to see out on on Bill's farm and the things that the things that they're doing there. Um, so we'll just move on now to our, our last and final uh, presentation this evening, um, and that is going to be delivered by Phelan uh, Connolly. Phelan's uh, an agri, -envi agri environment advisor with Caffrey um, as well, and Phelan's going to set out. A bit more about carbon emissions on beef farms um, and how a farmer can reduce uh, emissions and improve uh, profitability. Maybe while we're waiting for the, the video to come up there, um, Elizabeth, could could we maybe take a couple of questions? Um, just uh, to just to see where we get the technology to work here. So, Elizabeth, uh, first question here: Do you think that beef farmers can reach net zero on a farm level? Net so greenhouse gases, as I explained, the two big sources are diet digestion because ruminants have four stomachs. Um, and the um, application of manure and fertilizer. So I think there's big gains to be made in application of manure and fertilizer. I think some farms will be able to because they'll be able to maybe have the woodland that Bill has or, or, or you know, extensive hedgerows and, and, and forestry, agroforestry, whatever, um, to offset the methane emissions from the cattle. Um, but and others won't. So I, I think it's some will be able to, if they have that land mass and are able to manage their grassland and their land platform uh, such that, you know, maybe their stocking density suit um, lower intensity um, versus um, with a bit of woodland, whereas others others won't. And that's why I do think it's going to be a big challenge for the industry as a whole. But I think there's definitely huge potential to have lower, much lower carbon farming than what we currently have. We're just going to try and go back to Phelan's presentation there. Thanks, Elizabeth, for covering that. So hopefully the technology will work now. Um, um, we'll come back to the questions later. 
Good evening. My name is Phelan Connolly and I'm an Agri-Environment Advisor within Cabfree's Beef and Sheep Team for the Western Region. This evening I want to speak to you about carbon emissions on beef farms and more specifically how farmers can reduce emissions and improve farm profitability. Before we go any further this evening, I would like to compliment Bill on the many good practices that he is implementing on his farm to make it more carbon efficient and environmentally sustainable. I work closely with beef farmers just like you, who are participating in CAFRI's environmental business development groups. Our aim is to improve business and technical efficiency through advice, collaboration and knowledge exchange. As part of these groups, farmers have had an opportunity to complete a carbon benchmark of their farm, alongside a financial benchmark. I then review in depth the completed carbon benchmark reports and in conversation with the farmer we explore opportunities for technology adoptions that will in time improve the carbon footprint of the farm and also have a positive impact on farm profitability. A carbon footprint identifies the quantity and source of greenhouse gas emissions associated with an activity or a product through its life cycle and when benchmarked highlights areas where improvements can be made that will reduce emissions and save money. This evening I thought it would be useful to highlight the main information required to complete a carbon footprint. We need to record all the farm inputs with the main players being concentrates, fertilizers, purchased feeds, purchased livestock and fuel. We then gather the information on land management, understanding how much silage and grazing ground there is and any areas of woodland. We account for the different types of fertilizer used grass utilised and percentage of time livestock are at grass and housed. We also look at flooring systems, number of livestock, age at calving, daily live weight gain and mortality. And finally we think about livestock sales, crops sold or any other exports off farm. This pie chart represents the beef farmers participating in environmental business development groups that have already completed a carbon benchmark. It highlights the main gases as a percentage of the overall emissions produced on farm. As you can see, methane from digestion and manure management make up over 50% of emissions, followed by nitrous oxide from chemical fertilizer application, manure management and slurry application, and then carbon dioxide. Every farm that completes a benchmark will have different figures and the percentage of different gases may make up a larger or smaller part of the emissions depending on the different types of systems. The overall emissions for the farm can be broken down per enterprise, per unit of output, per hectare or per livestock unit to allow comparisons to be made. Per unit of output is currently the most common way to express emissions associated with the production of food. Methane and nitrous oxide make up the largest proportion of emissions on beef farms. There are a number of key efficient farming themes that all farmers can focus on to reduce those emissions. This evening I want to focus on two themes, better nutrient management and better livestock management, as I believe they are win-wins for farmers in terms of increasing productivity and profitability while simultaneously reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Some of these themes have already been referred to by Bill and Sinead. However, I want to give a little more detail as to why they are important from a carbon perspective. Better nutrient management starts by improving nutrient efficiency. A soil analysis provides a baseline to determine the fertility of the fields in your farm. Identifying the levels of acidity in your soils, you will also find out the amount of phosphorus available and potash, and identify any additional nutrients that are required to grow your crop. Understanding your soil's fertility will allow you to improve nutrient uptake and can also allow you to, to reduce spend on unnecessary chemical fertilizer. A recent analysis of over 6,000 soil samples taken from grassland and submitted by business development groups showed that only 7% of samples were at optimum levels for soil fertility. Use of the Calfrey Nutrient Calculator at DERA's online services page will allow you to put in place a fertilization plan for the coming year to help you address your soil fertility requirements. We need to target mineral soils at a pH level of 6 to 6.3. 
This is the optimal for perennial ryegrass and white clover swards to function. 43% of grassland in Northern Ireland, excluding rough grazing, requires lime. Lime application every 3-4 to four years improves the utilisation of all other nutrients and is a simple way to improve productivity and soil health in the process. At a pH level of 5 to 5.5, over 30% of chemical fertiliser value is lost. At 5.5 to 6, the percentage of fertiliser wasted reduces to 21%, and at 6 to 6.5, no compound fertiliser is wasted. If we assume that you currently grow all your grazing and silage requirements through the use of on-farm slurries and purchased inorganic fertilisers for the year, and your pH levels are not at optimal, then there is the potential to reduce your chemical fertiliser requirement by between 20 to 30% if you address pH. Addressing pH will reduce your carbon footprint by reducing your fertiliser requirements or by reducing your purchased feed requirements in the respect of more grass grown. Nitrogen fixing legumes such as clover ideally require a pH of 6.3 and if we want to keep clover in the sward and avail of free nitrogen from the atmosphere then pH levels are critical. Nitrous oxide is the most potent greenhouse gas and has almost 300 times more global warming potential than CO2. It's released from the application of organic and inorganic fertilizer. Moving slurry application from summer to spring reduces the amount of nitrous oxide losses to the atmosphere due to more favorable spreading conditions such as cooler and duller weather. Using lassie spreading instead of splash plate further reduces the amount of ammonia and nitrous oxide losses at application. Depending on the lassie application type, ammonia emissions can be reduced by between 30 to 70 percent. Research also shows that lassie spreading can grow up to 25 percent more grass than splash plate, therefore making better use of on-farm nutrients. Knowing your soil nutrient levels can allow you to target manures to parts of the farm that require it more. For example, fields low in potash or phosphorus could be supplied with slurry in spring to address these deficiencies. Lessee can also allow greater opportunity to spread on grazing ground without contaminating grass leaf. When purchasing nitrogen fertilizer such as CAN, consider switching to protected urea. It has an inhibitor which stops its releasing nitrous oxide to the atmosphere and is less volatile to weather conditions. This will again reduce emissions. The natural follow-on from better nutrient efficiency is looking at grassland management. Time and again we are told that one of our best natural advantages is growing grass in this country, but there is no point in growing more grass unless we can utilise it effectively. Increasing days at grass and improving grass utilisation through rotational grazing go hand in hand. Location, soil type and weather all play a part in this, but so does our management. Up to 50% of Northern Ireland farmers continue to operate a set stocking system. However, the change over to using a rotational grazing system does not need to be expensive and can be implemented in a temporary way until you are satisfied that it works. AFB research shows dry matter per hectare can be increased from 6 to 10 tonnes when switching from set stock to rotational grazing systems without any increase in fertiliser use. The key in rotational systems is to graze and rest. If cattle graze an area for three days, then it is rested for three weeks and allowed to regrow. Infrastructure is important when setting up a rotational or paddock system, with particular emphasis given to laneways, access to drinkers and shelter. Growing more grass is our cheapest form of high quality feed and will again reduce our reliance on purchased concentrates. If we have better control of our grazing, then we can also manage and measure grass, as Bill showed in his video, and budget to understand if we need to apply fertiliser or not. Furthermore, if weather conditions are suitable, it can aid farmers to extend the grazing season at the shoulders of the year and limit damage to soils in wet conditions. All farmers can identify underperforming fields in their farms. Not all land types lend themselves to full reseeding options on a regular basis, and in these cases, sward rejuvenation should be considered as a practical alternative. 
coming in at just over half the cost of a full reseed. Sward rejuvenation has been shown to increase production by up to 40% in the short to medium term. This increased production can help reduce costs while also increasing output, and these two factors combine well to improve the carbon footprint of the farm. As animals will gain more weight off grass or at silage, and either finish earlier, spending less time on farm, or reduce the reliance on purchase concentrates. It also gives us an opportunity to stitch in clover. Clover brings a variety of benefits as it fixes nitrogen from the atmosphere, greatly reducing the quantity of inorganic nitrogen used. Offbee research has shown that under ideal conditions, clover can fix up till 150 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare, or in basic terms, could be worth five bags of 24% nitrogen to the acre. Clover is an excellent companion to perennial ryegrass as they have complementary growing structures. Perennial ryegrass is more active in the early part of the year, whilst clover requires slightly warmer soil temperatures and will continue growing into the autumn, extending your grazing season. Clover does require good management and is particularly vulnerable to broadleaf weed herbicides, commonly used in grassland management. The timing and application of herbicides should be carefully considered when completing reseeds or sward rejuvenation, and in cases of weed infestation, use of a spot sprayer or weed wiper will be more preferable than a boom sprayer. Large crops of mature grass harvested for silage may cost less per tonne, however the nutritional value per tonne is also much lower leading to increased use of concentrates to fill the nutritional gap. With tight margins and the fact that stock can be housed for up to six months of the year, we need to focus on improving our silage quality to reduce costs and emissions. Getting a silage analysis and targeting silage towards the correct stock type throughout the winter will help in lowering feed costs. As feed costs account for the largest proportion of variable costs in livestock systems, the aim should be to reduce these as much as possible. This can be achieved by maximising silage quality and balancing the diet with concentrates only when necessary. Reducing concentrate use will have a positive impact on carbon emissions. When we think of better animal performance, we think about more kilograms of output per cow per year. This improves carbon efficiency and profitability. In any year that a cow does not produce a calf, it reduces profitability and increases the carbon footprint for the rest of the herd. The target calving index for a herd should be 365 days, or one calf per cow per year. For example, if we take a 50 cow herd with a calving index of 415 days, it is only producing 44 calves out of 50 cows per year. Remember, this is only two missed heats, so fertility and heat detection are essential tools in our drive towards improved carbon efficiency. For this same herd, the cost of feeding those empty cows at 40 pence per day for an additional 50 days costs an additional 20 pounds per head. The lost calf growth, if we assume one kilo of daily live weight gain per day, at a livestock sale price of 240 per kilo over 50 days is another 120 pounds. This equates to a total cost of £140 per head, or £7,000 across the herd. To improve cow fertility, we need to keep good accurate records of birth dates and calving ease. We need to reduce calving difficulty through sire selection and feed management. We need to ensure body condition is appropriate at calving and breeding, do not keep problem cows in the herd. Do not breed replacements from late calvers. Select replacement heifers for maternal traits. And if we are purchasing breeding heifers, buy with good information on sire and dam if possible. Farms that consistently have better carbon efficiency show the following traits. They have higher levels of calves per year. They have lower mortality rates. They aim to calve heifers down at 24 months. They have higher daily live weight gains at grass and off silage. They have higher growth rates from genetics. 
and they have high herd health status, with less respiratory and parasitic problems and good mineral status. So my take home message for this evening. Carbon reduction is a challenge, but significant carbon savings are achievable by improving many things incrementally rather than one thing 100%. This is because when one small component is made more efficient, that efficiency will resonate through the system and enable reductions across the entire life cycle. Carbon is also an opportunity to improve profitability. Being carbon efficient is good business sense. Carbon footprinting highlights the inefficiencies and waste within a system and allows you to do something about it. Measure to manage. When we reduce our reliance on inputs that are subject to volatile price changes like fertilizer, meal and fuel, we have better control of our costs, which can leave more gross margin and less emissions. And finally, there is no one size fits all. Make the most of what you have got. There is room within every system to make improvement. But keep it simple. A focused approach on soil, grassland and livestock efficiencies will ultimately help reduce the sector's overall emissions. I'd like to thank you this evening for listening and I will now pass back to Ailing for any questions. Thank you, Phelan, for that. Um, uh, and now uh, we're going to move on to the, the interactive part of this evening. So I'll ask all our panellists if they'll turn their, their cameras on so that you can all see them. Um, and I'll just introduce them briefly again. So we have Elizabeth McGowan from, from AFBE. We have Phelan Connolly from CAFRE. Bill Harper, who was the, the farmer that we featured on the video. And we also have um, Alethea Brown from CAFRE. So Alethea, we haven't heard from yet tonight. So Alethea is um, Alethea's a senior technologist at CAFRI in the sustainable land management branch. And uh, she works on all the kind of greenhouse gas and carbon um, issues there um, and with a focus on greenhouse gas uh, uh, calculators. So Alethea, maybe just to bring you in, because we haven't heard from you yet um, this evening, could you maybe give us um, your thoughts around the side of why a farmer should carry out uh, benchmarking, carbon benchmarking, and the process for that, how a beef farmer can sign up for that, um, uh, and uh, sort of some, some background information around what, what CAFRI do on, on carbon benchmarking. Thank you. Yes, um, well, here at CAFRI, we do offer carbon benchmarking through the Environmental Business Development Group program. So any farmer that is a member of that can avail for carbon footprint. Um, so carbon benchmarking, and provides a farm business with information on their greenhouse gases, where their greenhouse gases come from on farm, the quantity. And you know, ultimately that's what we want to know is we want to be able to measure so we can put um, practices in place to reduce our emissions. But carbon, uh, carbon benchmarking is all about, um, I suppose, raising awareness at this stage. We want to really inform everyone out there in the subject of carbon and greenhouse gas emissions and really prepare them for any future legislation or policy that's coming coming down the line. Um, what was your second question? Sorry, Ailey. It just, I mean, how, how does a farmer sign up for it, um, Alethea? Can they, can anybody do it or is it limited um, uh, with, within the CAFRI system? Yeah, I am. Well, I was just saying there, yeah. Only those that are part of environmental uh, business development groups can sign up at the moment and they can have their free carbon uh, footprint. Um, an advisor, it's really, if you want to uh, complete a footprint, contact your advisor. They will arrange for the data collection of your carbon footprint and will pr uh, provide that interpretation of the report and feedback on how you can reduce your emissions. Um, now, the environmental business development groups, that's a pilot project at the moment. So we're just assessing how that actually works and has rolled out within with those members. And once that is completed, uh, carbon benchmarking will be rolled out further to business development group members, um, hopefully in the near future. Thanks, Alethea. And maybe just, Bill, could you give us a bit of a feel for how you find the whole carbon benchmarking process? Okay, uh, Eileen, <clears throat> the carbon benchmarking process uh, was very informative. Um, we collected the data. I, I really do a lot. Of, I really do financial 
benchmarking and the data that needed to be collected uh, was about 90% uh, already there with the financial benchmarking. Um, there was a very small amount uh, of data and that was really a telephone conversation between myself and um, the, uh, the, um, the support assistant who's collecting data. Um, then I met with uh, Sinead and we went through the report uh, and highlighted where we thought we could maybe make adjustments uh, in the future. Um, but without the carbon footprint um, report, I really wouldn't have had an idea at all as to uh, how much carbon I was producing or, or where on the farm I was producing it. Um, and so I find it very enlightening and very useful. And we're going to do it every other year. Um, so, so we'll have, have a couple of years then to tackle this this um, this problem that I have too much fertilizer. And but, but with the way the way fertilizer prices are maybe going to go, that will solve itself because we're not going to afford to buy any. So. <laughs> I was going to say that, Bill. Uh, maybe everybody will be reducing their fertilizer uh, next year with the way things are going. Elizabeth, moving back to you again. Um, looking at the inventories. So there's a question here really around the, the Lulu CF inventory, the land use land use change shows the contribution and sequestration of carbon where the agriculture um, side only shows agriculture as a contributor. Can you maybe explain that? Um, just uh, it's more I suppose a way of how the inventories are collected. So can you maybe just outline a wee bit around that please? Take my on mute off. So yeah, th th there has to be some mechanism in government to sectorize where the emissions are, are going to and coming from. Um, and, and this is the, the system that they have adopted where, you know, agriculture is a sector in its own right and land use and land use change and forestry are a sector in its own right. To be fair, at a governmental level, you know, they look at everything in the round. So whilst it may seem that agriculture is not getting credited for carbon sequestration, et cetera, be fair, you know, government look at everything in the round and they do appreciate that, you know, it is the agricultural practices that are, you know, managing the land and, excuse me, contributing significantly to that land use and land use um, um, forestry sector. So, you know, I wouldn't be, you know, it's good that it's being counted. It's it's the way the government accounting has worked for it. Um, and you know, it's it's not it's not missed that agriculture plays a significant role in that Lulu CF sector. It, it becomes a bit more complicated in your carbon calculator then because it's all one one and, and netted off. And, and that's where I think just people have to be clear and, and understand that there are differences between the two. But it's not that one's right or one's wrong. It's just the different ways of accounting a on a gross emissions basis versus on a carbon footprint basis. Yeah, thanks, Liz. But that is very confusing in the way there's so many different ways of working out, um, you know, the inventory and then carbon calculators and so on. There's another question here, Elizabeth, around where emission totals um, for, uh, you know, uh, beef from the dairy herd and uh, beef itself, where those emissions are counted. So um, I think what you've said is you're going to come back on that because you're not just quite sure on the slides you presented. So we pick on that one, I pick up on that. So yeah, I just give you to cover that any question that we don't get through tonight, we will we will write out yeah. uh, or email out the answers to. So we'll maybe come back yeah. on that one. And um, well, what I would say, Aileen, is you know we're all in this together. You know, it, it's gross emissions, and we all have to work together. And actually, there's collaboration within the livestock sector, within the sectors of like agriculture, and, and between agriculture and energy, etc. So for that and to be fair as say government do recognize um, net zero and, and sectors will be considered accordingly whenever it comes to that as in agriculture um versus others uh, thanks. <coughs> moving back again uh, to you bill here there's a, a sort of practical question there about how you find grazing cattle on and off the multi-species wards and do the cattle cope okay with the change of diet yes Eileen. Never were suckled cows looked as often uh, as man were or the first week on the multi-species sword. Uh, I was waiting for bloat because of the because of clover, uh, but they burped and hiccuped their way through it and nobody swelled up and uh, they seemed to be fine. Um, they also seemed to like it well enough um, and got onto it okay. I've had three full rounds of grazing now of that field of multi-species swords. Uh, it's had no 
fertilizer, uh, no, no nitrogen fertilizer at all this year. It had one bag of 10, 24, 24 when it was sown, and it's ready for grazing again. Uh, so it's worked fine. Um, the weather has now turned and it's wet and soil is getting wet. Um, it's a wet, heavy field. I'm not sure how they're going to get on, to, on with it when they get onto it. Uh, they'll be looked regularly again. Um, I, I don't want to trump it up because it's a new sword, but we'll see how it goes. But so far, so good. So we look forward to hearing how you get on, Bill, with that. Um, there's a, a question here, maybe feeling maybe for you, but um, pass it on if, it, if it's not. But it's really about the role native uh, beef cattle can um, play in reducing emissions from beef production. Um, Elizabeth, you might want to comment on that as well from a scientific point of view. So there's, a, for example, Belted Galloway's is, is listed here. Yeah, um, I, suppose, I suppose from my perspective, um, you know, <clears throat> All breeds have a part to play in this. Um, my focus within my uh, talk was very much about fertility and and what we know there um, from the best from the best uh, producers in the business is that hybrid vigor is very important in this scenario. And and whether it's using continental breeds or traditional breeds, it's very much about focusing on the on the the, the better traits within the herd and looking for maternal traits within your cows. To improve cow fertility and make sure you get a, a, a calf on the ground every year just as bill referred to in his video you know so it's very much about having efficient cows not necessarily specifically about the breed in my mind thanks thanks Phelan. um elizabeth do you want to comment on that at all on native breeds or are there any research being done around um yeah the, 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 i'm not aware of any research just just linking it all through but bottom line is for any breed any system driving efficiency will reduce your carbon footprint and, and that's the most the other side of the equation is you know this is all about reducing gross emissions whilst optimizing outputs so you know and depending on the land type you're working on you know those maybe a breed of breeds maybe more suited to a land type versus your charlies and your limousines on, on the lowland etc so it's all about what you can maximize from the land type as well um, and just again, maybe Elizabeth, for you, um, is there any plan for a standardized carbon calculator to be made available um, so that you can bench, you know, we can easily benchmark? Um, and maybe Alethea, just to comment on CAFRI are using the agri -cal calculator, is, is, can you maybe say why you decided to go down that route? Um, I mean, there's a, there's a range available at the minute. Um, so maybe you want to comment on that. Yeah, no, there are a range and, and the industry is crying out for harmonization of these calculators because, you know, as I said before, that there's a range of qualities and they can tell you different answers. So, you know, I'm, I'm aware that government are starting to talk about how they can harmonize the calculators, but the calculator is a business in its own right. The, the calculator development industry is there and, it, you know, it's hard then to harm. It's like harmonizing, I don't know, kettles or something like that or, or ovens um, all into the same kind of thing. So um, there is, there's some frameworks out there that, that do um, talk back to, but there's still a need for harmonization and government are looking at that. Yeah, um, I would just uh, uh, reiterate that there is a need there for a standardized calculator and, you know, hopefully uh, down the line something um, can, can come of that. But yes, we here at CAFRI, we're using the AgriCalc uh, carbon calculator. And the reason we selected that was basically set on a number of criteria, but I suppose the primary reason was because it measured whole farm emissions. Many of the greenhouse gas calculators would either you know, measure one enterprise or one product, and that didn't reflect our Northern Ireland mixed farm system. So we had to um, you know, look at, and try and find a calculator that would suit us here in Northern Ireland. So that's really the reason why we went with AgriCalc. But um, I suppose if you are looking uh, to pick or select a calculator, you know, just look to uh, read about the calculator you're selecting and it's, you know, go for something that has a good scientific um, evidence behind it and is robust and, you know, has maybe some validation uh, process inbuilt to it uh, because, you know, if you're going to provide a, a carbon footprint as evidence, you maybe want to have that uh, built in um, if, if any uh, retailers or processors are, are, are wanting some evidence of that. 
Thanks, Lethia. And, and sort of another question, sort of again on the, the, the carbon calculators. I know it's a bit of a bugbear of farmers about getting the full, uh, so all the sequestration on their farm accounted for. Can you maybe comment if hedges, for example, um, are included in the agri calc uh, calculator uh, and trees um, on the farm as well and, 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 and grass, you know, soils under grassland too? Yeah, um, on AgriCalc currently you can only uh, account for your carbon sequestration associated with woodland. Um, they have set their modules for uh, soil carbon and hedgerow, but uh, they're not getting launched until early next year. So yes, they are there, but um, they won't be released until next year. So when we go to uh, re-benchmark our uh, uh, farmers within the environmental business development groups, we will have uh, the carbon sequestration modules included and that will be accounted for in their second uh, benchmark. Okay, well, will that confuse things though if they're, you know, they did, you know, you're changing nearly, you know, how can you compare the results of this uh, benchmark and when you're changing and then what you're measuring the next time around, will you be able to kind of pull that out? Yeah. I mean, it'll make the answer obviously look better because you've more sequestration in there, but is there is there a difficulty there that it's just, you're not comparing like with like with the two calculations? No, definitely not. The way the calculators are set up, they're set up on modules. So um, the emissions is one module and the sequestration is a, like a second module. So you, you will focus on reducing your emissions and you will focus on increasing your sequestration. So the fact that they are separate, you will be able to go back and compare like with like on your emissions and like with like on your sequestration. If that makes sense. So uh, it will be comparable. Good, good stuff. Um, I'm not sure whether this is maybe for for this webinar or not, but there is a question around here around sort of the supply chain. Is there any any evidence yet that the supply chain are asking for carbon footprint um, of cattle? Um, is it something that's likely to come in uh, in the future? And then there's another one really around there about potential for um, the processors paying a, a premium for um, for those that are maybe more grass based or slaughtered at an earlier age. So maybe um i don't know who wants to comment on that uh well maybe you want to pick up if, if what do you think about getting a premium there for um for cattle slaughtered at an earlier age and um, do you think that would drive change quicker in the in the industry getting a premium from the slaughterers uh, it's a bit like pulling teeth it's difficult <laughs> um I, it's, it's I, th I think i can see it being used as a marketing tool um, probably coming from the supermarkets and then down through um, the, the, the processors. Um, um, it's interesting, uh, I was on a webinar not so long ago where one of the guys said the only way we'll really make an impact, and he was talking about right across the economy uh, on, on greenhouse gas, was to stop emitting it or emit less of it. Don't emit it. And um, I, I was thinking about how are we going to do that in the farm? But that earlier slaughtering is one thing. I mean, if you can slaughter the animals at 20 months instead of 24 months, there's four months and they're not emitting. If you can bring that down to 18 months. Um, and um, I think that's possible with, with genetics. Um, and in fact, it's been done here and there uh, that, that Cattle are being slaughtered up nearly 400 kilos now at 16 months of age. Maybe they're bulls, uh, but even so. So I, I think there's a fair bit of potential there for, you know, just reducing the emissions by earlier slaughtering. Thanks, Will. Uh, we're, we're really running out of time here. There's still loads of questions, so we will we will come back to those people or to, to everybody um, on, on terms of the questions that we haven't covered tonight. I just want to ask you all one last question, um, if you give a very quick answer, but I would like you to maybe just say, for the, the beef farmers that are on the call tonight, what one thing should they do or should they start looking at sort of now or within the next wee while to really tackle the sort of carbon issue on, the, on their farms? Elizabeth, start with you there. Thank you, Matt. Um, driving efficiency, big time, and and you know, so different farmers will have different um, ways to do that. But optimizing grass usage, um, clover adoption, and and really driving more from their land through efficiency, age of calving, all of that. That's those are known technologies that win win on profitability and carbon footprint and gross emissions. 
So I you. stole that for the you, rest you, of you. You know, keep everybody's <laughs> answer there. So. Yeah, I was going to say, yes, uh, just exactly what Elizabeth said there. But I would encourage everyone to measure. So if they can, you know, go and find out uh, if you can, um, you know, contact your advisor and get a, uh, help with uh, measuring your carbon footprint. And feeling from a, if somebody comes to you as an agri environment advisor, what, what direction would you point them in? Yeah, I think I think from a farmer's perspective, the key thing here is keeping accurate records, uh, so that year on year you can go back and and look at your results, whether that be improved calf weights, uh, better cow fertility, better calving index, all those things will all play into improving your carbon footprint. And, and Bill, maybe from a farmer's point of view, if you have any, any tips for, for some of your fellow farmers on the line tonight? Well, leading, leading on from what Philip has just said, where, you, where you, you keep records and you measure, well, then you, you break it down into the various sectors of your business and you'll see whether you're good at it or not good at it. And if you're not good at it, then you take that and focus in on it and start making an improvement there and you just chip at it one by one. Thank you. And I think that's, that's, a, that's a good way to, to finish. So, I mean, just uh, I hope everybody can see that from um, tonight's uh, webinar that there are there are challenges uh, ahead of us in addressing carbon emissions, but there are also opportunities, particularly around this whole efficiency message and opportunities to even reduce costs on your farm. So there, 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 there's lots of things that we can all our farmers can start doing uh, now you know, to, to address this issue. So just to, just to sort of close, um, thank you so much to our panellists tonight, Elizabeth, Alethea, Bill and Phelan, uh, and also to Sinead who featured on the video, to, um, to Catherine and Mark who have been keeping me right in the background and doing all the sort of technology bits and pieces, and to Heather who, um, who has sort of been putting together the whole organisation of the, of the series. Um, to our key organisers, CAFRE, AFBE, the LMC, NIMEA and the NBA. Um, and also thank you to everybody who's who's asked questions. Sorry, we just didn't get through them all tonight, but we will um, send an email out with a link with the recording um, and we'll, we'll get answers to you in due course. So the last thing just to, to say tonight is just to remind you of the final webinar in this uh, beef uh, series, which will take place on Thursday, the 21st of October. Um, and the focus of that webinar will be around the uh, supply chain sustainability. So um, without further ado and not keeping you back any longer, I'll just say thanks again and good night. <laughs>